Good morning. This is the time and place for zoning cases hearing for March 12th, 2014. My name is Bradley Collin and I will be conducting the hearing as a hearing officer. We have two cases at one location scheduled for today and the relevant exhibits are posted on the panels located directly behind me. If you wish to speak, please write your name and address on one of the speaker forms which have been provided at the front door and submit it to our planning assistant. I would like to also inform everyone that the official proceedings of the planning hearing officer hearing are recorded on tape as part of the public record. Notification of this hearing was accomplished by the use of public notices which were mailed to property owners and occupants located within 500 feet of the subject property, physically posted on the site in question, and placed in the local newspaper. The hearing will proceed as follows. Case planner will make a brief overview of the case, give analysis, make a recommendation. The applicant will be asked to come forward stating both name and address. Be asked to present the case within a 15 minute time limit if needed. Others in support of or opposition to the applicant and interested parties will be asked to come forward to speak. Again, clearly stating both name and address within a three minute time limit. Lastly, the applicant will be given the opportunity to make closing comments if desired in response to testimonies given by preceding speakers within a five minute time limit. The hearing will be closed and the case taken under submission or decision may be made. After the hearing, the decision will be prepared in writing, will be in the form of a letter sent to the applicant and to all persons who responded to the public notice either by speaking at this hearing or by submitting written responses and have provided their name and mailing address. The date of the decision will be the date on the letter. We have two cases scheduled for, well, two applications scheduled for today. One's a conditional use permit and one's a variance. Under provisions of Title 30, Chapter 30.42 of the Glendale Municipal Code, a conditional use permit shall be granted if four of the required findings are present. They are, first, that the proposed use will be consistent with the elements and objectives of the general plan. Second, that the use and its associated structures and facilities will not be detrimental to the public health or safety or the general welfare or the environment. Third, that the use and facilities will not adversely affect or conflict with adjacent uses or impede the normal development of surrounding property. And fourth, the adequate public and private facilities such as utilities, landscaping, parking spaces, and traffic circulation measures are or will be provided for the proposed use. For the variance under provisions Title 30, Chapter 30.43 the Glendale Municipal Code, a variance shall be granted if four required findings are present, and they are first, that the strict application of the ordinance will result in practical difficulties or unnecessary hardship inconsistent with the general purposes and intent of the ordinance. Second, that there are exceptional circumstances or conditions applicable to the property involved or to the intended use or development of the property that do not apply generally to other property in the same zone or neighborhood. Third, that the granting of the variance will not be materially detrimental to the public welfare or injurious to the property or improvements in such zone or neighborhood in which the property is located. And fourth, that the granting of the variance will not be contrary to the objectives of this ordinance. If the evidence pre presented in the application and the hearing meets the criteria just described, then the hearing officer can either approve or impose conditions for approval on the case in question. If the findings of facts are not evident, the request will be denied. The case before us is a standards variance application and a conditional use permit application to construct two new broadcast towers at 148 feet and 100 feet in height and to construct an ancillary unstaffed communications building at the existing Flint Peak Broadcasting and Transmission Facility on a primary ridge line located at 3600 Barango Drive, located in the ROS, which is a residential open space zone, floor area district three. This time I'd like to ask our case planner to give us a brief overview of the case. See from there, Mr. Baxter. All right. Thank you, Mr. Collin. As you noted, 
This is a property uh, known as Flint Peak at 3600 Marengo Drive. Uh, the address uh, has been changed from the 1048 Marengo Drive to 3600 Marengo Drive at the request of the fire department as well as the building and safety department. You can see their comments are listed in the file under the comment sections. Uh, they stated that the, or I should say the fire department stated that the 1048 address was technically not correct. It was not property owned by the applicant. It was an address that we had used because uh, it, at the time uh, we felt it was the most appropriate, but then with this application, uh, the fire department uh, in working with the building department determined that a more appropriate address would be the 3600. Now regarding background for the the case, as we mentioned, it's for the construction of two broadcast towers, one 148 feet and one 100 feet in height, and an auxiliary communications building, a Vista, a communications building, uh, at an existing transmission facility on a primary ridge line in the ROS residential zone. Uh, now, currently, this location, Flint Peak, if you look, uh, the, the property is located right here. And you can see how it's related to the neighboring areas. So, this is residential and open space zones around, or I should say, special recreation zones all the way around it. Closest properties that have any uh, what we'd call the sensitive receptors would be the residential areas here, and uh, just a kind of a quick estimation: it's about 2,200 feet away from this property, and much lower than this property. In fact, if you look at the photographs behind you, you'll see that the average uh, view is shows this as a very distant peak, and. Uh, that's location. Then south is the landfill, all landfill area over here. And Glen Oaks Canyon is further down the hill over here, and this is Chevy Chase, but these Linda Vista, all very distant views. Uh, if you look at your the plans behind you, we have uh, an overview of the entire property that this site is located on, and then we have a, a zoomed-in area of the Flint Peak itself which historically has been since the 1950s. We found some records going back into the uh, mid to late 50s that show that there's been some type of uh, radio uh, and then TV broadcast facilities up there. No wireless facilities that we're aware of or that the applicants has uh, noted. Uh, the current site is also, uh, as you can look on the uh, plan over here on your left, or I should say my left behind you, that site, the colored version shows that the site is pretty much surrounded or is surrounded by chain link fence. I think it's about eight feet high and it's been developed with numerous uh, towers and several broadcast, uh, uh, I should say ancillary uh, broadcast uh, communications buildings. The new communications building is going to be on the bottom right in the gray area. That'll be the new building there and uh, the towers will be up uh, in the uh, in the central area of the uh, of the site. We also have some photographs over here that you can see, and uh, we have uh, elevations of the building and the uh, and the towers like you can see on the on the plans too. Okay, very briefly, because I think I've covered pretty much all of the background information. Very briefly, the. Under the uh, variance, just going through the different uh, findings, just a quick overview. Uh, 
prior to the construction of the two new towers, there's going to, the uh, applicant is going to be removing three towers, one that's 100 feet, one that's 79 foot, and one that is 58 foot in height. So those three towers will be removed. And this is part of a, uh, the applicant's proposal to consolidate and redesign the site's electrical distribution system uh, to introduce new broadcast technology. And this property uh, is a 23.4 acre site and it's the highest site in the area and the reason that the uh, towers need to be taller than what the code allows which is 15 foot height is because uh, they would need to uh, be higher than man-made or physical obstructions in order to provide a line of sight service which uh, would be consistent with the land use that they're proposing. And uh, so not to allow it, staff felt that that would be a practical uh, hard uh, difficulty, a practical hardship. And, uh, so we felt that this should be allowed. Plus they have a history of, of being this way uh, of these towers out there. In fact, the one tower is going to remain still the tallest tower that was previously proved uh, back in the, uh, it was the 50s. So these two towers would be lower in height, technically, than that tower, in terms of overall elevation height. Also should be noted that many of the uh, residential developments in the area were not even here uh, to, uh, when this towers and sites were being, uh, when the site was being developed. So uh, for instance, uh, some of the subdivisions are much newer. Uh, staff didn't feel that it would be a detriment to have uh, the uh, these two new uh, two new towers and ancillary uh, equipment building uh, being constructed uh, because we felt that it would be consistent with what's been up there on the site. The towers themselves would be visually insignificant at the distance most uh, residents would view them, and they would remain lower than the tallest tower uh, that was constructed. We felt that. Uh, tied in with that, it would not be uh, a conflict with the neighbors, wouldn't be detrimental to the neighbors itself, uh, because again, these uh, towers and the site have been developed since the 50s and consistently maintained since the 50s, uh, so we felt that it was being uh, developed consistent with that uh, type of development in that area. Uh, we feel that the uh, proposals being consistent with the objectives of the ordinance and the general plan. In the, for instance, in the zoning code, they do allow broadcast and wireless facilities in this zone, which is a residential open space zone. And the subdivision code uh, does allow uh, transmission facilities on primary ridge lines through the use of the conditional use permit. So that's also why the applicant is applying for a CUP. Time. Now, under the conditional use permit section of the code, uh, again, the first condition uh, that n needs to be reviewed uh, is the uh, being consistent with the general plan. It's similar to what was raised up, up here in the variance section. We did note that the open space and conservation element addresses uh, visual and scenic resources. Uh, it should be noted that. Uh, general plan does note that the San Rafael Hills, where Flint Peak is located, has, has undergone a greater amount of development than other ridge lines in the city. And also, as noted, the Subdivision Map Act does allow uh, the uh, under a CUP process to have these types of transmission facilities up there. And zoning code also allows it up there. So obviously, this is something that's been thought about in the past and. Um, placed in the, uh, the codes for staff to use on a discretionary basis when the types of applications are submitted. The access, we didn't feel there would be any issues with circulation element because uh, the site uh, does not directly uh, access uh, any uh, local streets or uh, as far as the circulation element goes, uh, you get to this uh, site through Marengo Drive on a what they call the radial lateral fire road. Uh, that's off of Marengo Drive. 
or through the East Glen Oaks Boulevard when you go through Shoal Canyon. And again, another one of the findings uh, for these conditional use permit is the detrimental. Is, you know, would the project be detrimental? And the staff feels it would not. The nearest sensitive receptor is about 2,200 feet away. Uh, the Flint Peak has been developed with these types of facilities for years. And so the visual impact to the neighbors would basically be the same because we're removing three and putting up two. So there's a net loss of one tower. So in a sense, it's it's uh, to, uh, to it's better to lose a tower and then and just put one, uh, put remove three and put two up. So we feel it's it's actually a benefit. Uh, that pretty much wraps up my my discussion on those findings. Uh, the following in the staff report, we actually have more formal findings. Discussion, and then we have some conditions of approval. Uh, the conditions of approval are fairly standard. They include some concerns that the fire department, building and safety department, the integrated waste department wanted to have incorporated. They're fairly standard ones. There's not much discretion related there, and the rest of them are are. Uh, uh, also standard conditions that we place on these types of projects. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Thank you, Mr. Baxter. I do have one question relating to the conditions of approval. The proposed tower, is this something that could potentially, going back up a step, um, have we met with the urban designer? Yeah, I'm going to be talking. Uh, the towers themselves, no. Uh, they're not well, I've, I've first, I first, yes, I have talked to the Urban Desire. The, the concerns they had were with the uh, with the building, which we could probably review under this new administrative review process for the design aspect. But the towers are uh, are an issue that we we're not going to. Uh, Is are the towers something that could potentially be exempted? It, it's the staff. Actually, we never got that far on it because we're not to the design review part. That's why we have a condition on here. But in the past, for cell towers throughout the city, it's difficult to to uh, do any uh, mitigation measure on a on these type of towers, uh, other than uh, having colors that might be uh, blend in with the sky. Something in, in other words, they're not like red, white, and blue flashing type things. They try to be subtle. But other than that, how do you screen a tower? And if you screen a tower, then you're in effect kind of defeating the purpose of having the tower, which is trying to get over man-made objects. Trying to, you know, man-made or, or natural uh, physical obstructions. So, uh, but this is uh, an issue that staff has sort of discussed since the beginning of these cell towers uh, throughout the city, not just this Flint Peak. But the building itself is something that we can look at. However, it's so far away that, and for most residential, it, you have either two conditions. Uh, if you're in the subdivision over closest to the property, you're almost, not all, not all the areas of the subdivision, but good number of the subdivisions underneath the hill, so to speak. You can't really see even the hill or the towers. The other parts of the subdivision can clearly see the hill, but it is at a distance that it's not as uh, this, this building is probably going to be completely screened by any type of landscaping or vegetation which is around the uh, perimeter of the fencing. Uh, if there is any part of the building that stands above it, it will be minimal. It's, it's, this okay. building is it's the whole purpose of the building is it's unstaffed. It's meant to just house uh, uh, the facilities for the towers. So so we have talked about it, but the towers themselves, I, I we don't really have anything that uh, any any process for that other than exempting them. Uh, but the building will probably go through the administrative design process. Okay. Thank you. 
this point, I'm going to open the public hearing. I have one speaker card for Tom Davis. Please give your name and address for the record, please. And if you could spell your street name. Street name, yes. Um, good morning, Mr. Collin and staff. My name is Tom Davis, uh, Davis Consulting Services, uh, located at 9672 Bryn Mawr Drive. That's B-R-Y-N-M-A-R, Villa Park, California. I'm uh, here to represent uh, Richland Towers, uh, my client and applicant. Um, this uh, project before you, um, we consider it as a consolidation project. Uh, Richland Towers uh, purchased this 23 acres and all of the improvements at this site uh, approximately four to five years ago, and ever since they purchased the property, they have been dedicated to make this a better uh, facility from a operating perspective, uh, safety perspective, and environmentally uh, sensitive perspective. Uh, we use the word consolidation because, as was pointed out by Mr. Baxter, uh, the primary uh, goal here is to consolidate um, existing towers, uh, three towers to uh, two towers. And uh, that is best uh, shown in an exhibit in um, exhibit uh, figure five. The um, existing H tower uh, and its uh, literally supporting guide uh, lines will be removed and replaced by a truss tower similar to the one that exists but shorter than the one that exists. And the two wooden um, uh, poles, basically, um, they are uh, what we would commonly refer to as wooden telephone poles, will be uh, uh, taken down and replaced by a uh, monopole. And then the last thing, as was mentioned by Mr. Baxter is the in construction of a low profile uh, equipment uh, building to uh, support newer and better, uh, fancier, more technically advanced uh, electronic equipment that is necessary to operate for TV and broadcasting facilities. This is not um, a cell phone. Uh, reception uh, generation um, type facilities. Um, this is not a wireless telecommunications facility. This is for uh, TV and FM radio broadcasting uh, only. We have uh, reviewed the conditions of approval and we um, um, will be more than happy to accept those. And I'm here to um, answer any questions. So the entities that are going to be located are using the proposed poles. Mm -hmm. Is it going to be more than, carrier is probably not the right word, more than one station? Or is it several stations? How is it? How does that work? Well, I... Um, I'm not technically capable of telling you in much detail how that works, but um, the new technology allows for more than one uh, frequency, radio station frequency, to be uh, transmitted um, on one at an antenna. Um, and so the antennas um, are attached to these structures, whether they're monopoles or the trust uh, tower. And so to answer your question, um, one antenna can serve more than one TV station or radio, uh, FM radio uh, broadcast station. Is it possible, based off the size of the antennas, that, say for example we have five TV stations and Five radio stations or FM stations or frequencies using it, will there ever be any need for modification to the tower to increase that 
or is the capacity that the tower has capable of, of covering what's needed? My understanding is that uh, the towers, uh, as proposed in this consolidation project, will uh, be sufficient to meet um, projected um, capacity for antennas and stations. So there won't be a need or, or potentially future applications coming that would require the antenna to be expanded, height or additional monopoles or anything like that? Not to my knowledge. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. I do not have any other speaker cards. I assume there's the applicant does not wish to rebut anything. So I'm going to close the public hearing. And based off the findings in the staff report as well as the testimony that was received today. I think the findings can be made for both the condition of Sir, did you? Mr. Collin, uh, just uh, present is uh, Kurt Wilkinson uh, representing uh, Richland Towers. His flight delayed uh, him to be here at the beginning of the hearing. Uh, I will ask Mr. or you may ask Mr. Wilkinson if he wishes to say anything. Mr. Wilkinson, did you? Not unless there's anything I, you have a question about. I think Tom was able to answer my questions. Okay. Great. Okay. As I was saying, based off the findings that were made in the staff report as well as the testimony that was received for both the conditional use permit and for the variance. And I'm going to make one change to, uh, I believe it's condition number 12 of both the conditional use permit and the variance, something that um, design review approval shall be obtained prior to issuance of a, bless you, building permit, and that would include either administrative or possibly an exemption as the modified condition for number 12. Okay. To give it a little bit more flexibility. Okay. It's not something that requires going to the board, then we probably should modify that to address it. Does that make sense? Yes, uh, yes I've sir. seen, uh, if you'd like, sir, what I'd like to recommend then is maybe approval slash exemption. You want to try something or just leave it as just the approval? I, I, I have to say, this is probably going to go to ADR, and it'll probably I, include I don't both want to, the polls and the... But I don't want to put board on here if it's going to go ADR. I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. So we can say that... But, but in a Administrative sense, design review or exemption shall be obtained prior to the issuance of a building permit. Okay. Does that cover it? As long as it's, I, the reason I, um, I think the design review board term doesn't necessarily, for instance, as, as you know, working our counters, it all says design review board and then it'll say exemption and then it'll say approved. I, I just think the idea of, it's, it's all underneath the design review. Um, it's all part of the design review board. Okay. Is that something that's workable for the applicant? Okay. And based off of that, I am going to approve both conditional use permits. The environmental for sure. I'm going to approve the environmental review um, on the project and then in addition to that, approve the conditional use permit and the subject variance based off the conditions and the modification to uh, the conditions specific to design review board to add more flexibility. So, under the appeal provisions, Title 30, Chapter 30.62 of the Glendale Municipal Code, the decision may be appealed to the Planning Commission within 15 days of the date of the decision. Anyone wishing to appeal may obtain forms and brochures on the procedures from the Building and Safety Section Permit Service Center located on the same floor of this building. The hearing is now officially closed. Thank you all for coming. 
and it is 10.02 on March 12th. Thank you very much.